ألف باء تاء ثاء جيم حاء خاء دال ذال راء زاي سين شين صاد ضاد طاء ضاء عين غين فاء قاف كاف لام ميم نون هاء واو ياء ا ت ت ث ج ح خ د ذ ر ز س ش ص ض ط ظاء ع غاء ف ق ك ل م ن ه و ي E B T C G H H D Z R Z C C C D D ضي عي غي في قي كي لي مي ني هي وي ي بو تو ثو جو حو خو دو ذو رو زو سو شو صو ضو ضو عو غو فو قو كو لو مو نو هو وو يو Okay, bismillah. The discussion is about vowels in the Arabic language. Unlike English, where vowels are made from the letters of the alphabet, in Arabic we have three distinct signs for vowels. And they are on the left hand side Dhamma, Fatha, and Kasra. So we have here a noon. So the way we would write a Dhamma is as follows it's like a small wow. And it has the sound of U. So the way you pronounce this is Nu. Nu. Secondly, we have the Fatha. Now, with Fatha, it's written as a line on top of letter. And it has the sound of A. That would be Na. Na. Finally, we have the Kasra. 
With the Kesra, it's similar to a Fetha, but it's written on the bottom of the letter. And it has a E sound. So that would be pronounced as Ni. Now, it's a good idea to memorize these three names, Dhamma, Fetha, and Kesra, which will help you through your studies in Arabic. So let's do an example of a word that has these three vowels in the word. So let's try to pronounce this word. So we have the, this is a kaf, so it has a ke sound, and on top of it is a dhamma, so there's an u sound. So that would be ku, ku. Then we have the ta with a kesra, so that would be ti. So ku, ti. And then we have the ba with a fetha on top. And remember the fetha has an a sound. So that would be ba. So it would be ku ti ba. Ku ti ba. Ku ti ba. Which means it was prescribed. So that's a brief explanation of vowels. Unlike uh, English, we have in English we have five vowels. A, E, I, O, U. In Arabic, we only have three. And they are what, what is known as Fetha, Dhamma, and Kesra. So, let's, let's first of all just um, understand how they're written. So, in front of us, we have the, the letter Tha. And when we add vowels in Arabic, it's different to English. We don't add them after the letter. We add it on top of the letter. So, Fetha will be written as follows. It's written with a line on top. Like that. Adhamma will be as follows. It's like a small wow. And we have the Kesra, which is like a Fetha, but on the bottom. So let's assume that this is the line where we write. The Fetha would be on top of the letter. Dhamma would be on top as well. And Kesra would be on the bottom. So Fetha, Dhamma, Kesra. So that's just the terminology, and inshallah we'll find out how they're actually pronounced. So we have the first, the first haraka, which is fetha. Now, for example, when we say the word cat, notice the a sound, a. It's a a sound, cat, a. That's the same sound of a fetha. Now we have here. I've transliterated cat into Arabic. So we have the kaf here, so it makes the same sound, the k sound. And then we have the, the ta, which is equivalent to the t in English. So this says cat. So notice the vowel is on top, not after it, as in cat. And obviously in English we write from left to right, while in Arabic we write from right to left. So in English, when we read a word, we read it this way. In Arabic, it's actually upwards, like that. So we read the first letter and what harakah it has first, the second letter, what harakah it has, and so on. Now, similarly, um, back, the word back, so it's the same sound, ah, back. Now, just one thing to note is, when we say this sound, the a uh, sound, um, you'll notice your mouth is open, wide, a, uh, a. Uh. Now let's just practice. We have here a word in Arabic. So to pronounce this, we have three letters here. We have the the jim, which has the j sound. Like, for example, the word jeep or jog. 
or Jupiter. So J, it's a J sound, and there's a Fatha there. So this will be pronounced as J. Then we have the Lam here. It's equivalent to the letter L in in English, like the word look. To pronounce the Lam with the Fatha, it's La. So J La. And then finally we have the Sin. That's equivalent to the the S sound in English. So this will be Sa. So J La Sa. J La Sa. So J La Sa means he sat. And notice we don't elongate. There's no elongation of the A sound. So we don't say A. Like in, for example, when we say the word car. Car. It's car. It's not car. So this will be one syllable. That's another syllable. And that's, an that's another syllable. So there's three syllables. J, le, se. Now here, when, when we say car, there's, there's, a, there's an elongation. That's, a diff that's written differently. And we'll explain that later on, inshallah. Just to note, it's just, it's a quick sound. So just J, le, se. J, le, se. Not ja la sa or ja la sa. No, ja la sa. There's no elongation. Okay, we've reached the dhamma now. So it's a small letter wow. What letter does a dhamma make? It's like the word book. Although there's two letters, both of the, um, there's two O's. Although there's two letters here, it's pronounced like a Dhamma. Unlike, for example, the word uh, choose. So when we say choose, there's an elongation there. We say choose, choose. We don't say choose. It's not choose. It's not choose. It's choose. So although in, in English they can actually sound differently, even though they're written the same way, they sound differently. In Arabic, we don't, we don't have this. So the way it's written is the way it's pronounced. To transliterate this in Arabic would be the following. Here. So we, it's this is the ba, and we have the dhamma. And you'll see this, it's going like this. That's just the way it's written. It doesn't really matter if it's like that or like this. It's the same thing. So, just one point note there. That's just the script. That's the way the script is. So that's a bat with a dhamma. Notice when I say dhamma, it's very important. Some people actually, they they say they don't say it with a with a dad. They say it with a dal. So they say dham dhamma. It's not dhamma. It's dhamma. Uh, maybe um, non-Arabs will find this hard to pronounce, but that's inshallah as you uh, progress in your Arabic studies, and when you actually learn the the uh, rules of pronunciation. Uh, you will improve on that, inshallah. We have here the ba with a dhamma, followed by the kaf, which is the the k, the k sound. So here it's pronounced as book. This letter alone with the dhamma would be bu, bu. So book. Similarly, we have the word in English put. It's put. So there's a U sound. That represents the sound that a Dhamma makes. Put. Now I didn't transliterate that put because actually there's no P sound in classical Arabic. Those in um, in Iraq, for example, they actually use the, the P sound. But actually it's not in the original um, in classical Arabic. So usually when, when you pronounce something with a P, it's represented by the bat, usually. Now let's just uh, practice this. We have a word composed of three letters. Both the first two letters are actually with a Dhamma. There's a scene. So we have, if we break this up, there's a scene with a Dhamma. Then there's a bat with a, with a Dhamma. 
and then Zedam. So to pronounce this, this is, has an S sound, so Su, Bu, and this is the Lam, like the letter L. So, Subul, Subul. Now I'm not pronouncing deliberately, I'm deliberately not pronouncing the last Harakah on this letter, because when we get to, when we start um, going to Arabic grammar, we'll find out that this actually changes. It's the same word, it'll be the same word, but the last letter, the harakah, or the vowel on the last letter will change, depending on the word's function in the sentence. Subul means paths. And that's the the plural of the word sabil. Sabil is a path, and this is the plural, paths. Let's get to the kasra. The kasra, as we showed you, is a line at the bottom of the letter. And the sound it has is like the word sit. So it's like the I in the word sit. So it's an E sound. E. So for example, if I transliterate that into Arabic, it's like that. So you have the, the scene with the kasra, si, and that's the ta. So sit, sit. So for example, we have the following word. It's ma, that's a fatha, so ma, and then the lam, li, and then the kaf, ki. So maliki, maliki. Malik means king. So let me just write this, a king. A. I, U, Ba, B, Bu, Ta, T, Tu, Tha, Fi, Thu, Ja, G, Ju, Ha, Hi, Hu, Kha, Khi, Khu, Da, Di, Du, Tha, Vi, Dhu, Ra, Ri, Ru, Za, Zi, Zu, Sa, Si, Su, Sha, Shi, Shu, Sa, Si, Su, Da, Di, Du, Ta, Ti, Tu, Va, Vi, ذو ع اي او غ غي غو ف في فو ق قي قو ك كي كو لا لي لو ما مي مو نا ني نو ح هي Hu, wa, we, wu, ya, yi, you. Okay, in this lesson we're going to be talking about the lack of a vowel, which in Arabic is known as sukun. Now here we have letter fa. I want to show you how sukun is written. Now when we actually represent no vowels, we don't just leave the letter without any marks. Sukun actually is represented by either like a small circle on top or with this mark here. So you will find both used. Now let's look at some examples. So if you remember the last video we went through these words and I transliterated the words into Arabic. That's cat, both in Arabic and English. Now here, we have a harakah there with the kaf, and then notice there's actually a stop on the letter T. So we say cat. So the T doesn't have any vowel associated with it. It's actually just a stop on the T. So in this case, we would actually put a sukun there cat. 
if we give it actually a mark, for example, the fatha, it'd be kata or katu or kati. Similarly, the word back. So it's back. So there's a sukun there as well. And we have the word book, same thing. Book is sukun there. Now I also want to mention so here the sentence reads Kharaja Rajlu min al Baiti and you stop there. Now notice the last letter has a kasra. When we actually stop, we give it a sukun. It, there's no sukun that's written down, but we we pronounce it as if there was a sukun. For example, in the Quran, this is in Surah Fatiha, "Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim." It's Mustaqima. There's a fatha there, but we don't pronounce that fatha when we stop. So we have this verse from the Quran, and I want to highlight something based on the script that is used in the famous uh, Saudi print of the Quran. So with this particular script, it uses this sign for sukun. So that says قُلْ That's a command, it means to say قُلْ So it's written like that. Then we have here another sukun, and there's another sukun there. Now, one thing to note, if you go a bit further on, we find this. Remember we said that sukun can also be represented by this sign here, by this it's like a circle. This circle in the Mus'haf is not a sukun. It doesn't re represent a sukun. And you actually find two types of these circles. One of them is like a normal circle. And one of them is more like a long circle, like that. Both of these are used in the Mus'haf to represent Tajweed rules. Now, outside of the Qur'an, you'll find that a sukun can be represented by an O. So, inshallah, in this lesson, we're going to be speaking about the long vowel. In Arabic, it's called Mad, which also means elongation. Now, in English, we have the following words. The word bad. Notice the elongation of the A sound. We don't say bad. We say bad. Similarly, we have the word feet. We don't say fit. We say feet. There's an elongation of the E sound. And also the word food. So we don't say food. We say food. So there's the elongation of the U sound. Food, not food. Now, if I transliterate this into Arabic, I get the following. So we have bad, feet, and food. In the first example, bad, it's the A sound that's being elongated. And that's denoted by this fatha here, which has the A sound, followed by the alif. And that's where we get the A sound, the elongation there, the long the long vowel. Similarly, here we have a kasra, and then following it is the ya. So it's a e sound. And finally, we have here a dhamma, followed by the wow. So it's a u sound. So we'll come to know actually that the long vowels are created in these three following ways, which are having a fetha, followed by the alif, a kasra followed by a ya and a dhamma followed by a wow. So they represent the three long vowels. So inshallah we'll go through some words and to see how the long vowels are pronounced. So here are some words. First one here is qala. Notice the elongation of the A sound. Qala. Not qala. Qala. So we have the fatha on the qaf, followed by the alif. Next word is jihad. So we have here g, that's the first syllable, and then had, jihad. 
So you notice here we have a fatha on the ha followed by the alif, and that gives the elongation of the a sound. Next word, Ibrahim. So here, ib ra. Notice here the ra fatha followed by the alif. Once again, it's a, a long vowel. Ibra. Not Ibra. Ibra. Ibra and then Heem. Ibrahim. Here the Ha has a Kasra followed by the Ya. So here there's the elongation of the E sound. It's He. Heem. Ibra. Heem. Similarly, here we have Kareem. Now Kareem is actually a adjective that means one who's generous. So here we have the Ra, Kasra, followed by the Ya. This is the Ya here. So Kareem, not Kareem. Next word, Maghdub. So Maghdub here has a Dhamma on the Dad, followed by the Wow. So it's an elongation sound, so it's a U sound, so it's Maghdub. And finally, here, Qubur. Qubur. So there's the U sound again. They have a Ba with the Dhamma, followed by the Wow. So you can see how the long vowel is formed there. Now there is another Mad, which is when two Hamzas come together. But I actually thought that it would be more appropriate to mention that, and when we get to the introduction to grammar, Arabic grammar. Now, just finally, I want to translate these words. So we have qala means he said. Jihad denotes the action of struggling and exerting effort. Ibrahim is the Arabic name for Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him. And as we said, Kareem means one who's generous. Maghdub denotes somebody who is the object of anger. So one who anger is directed towards. And finally we have the word qubur. Qubur is the plural of the word qabr, which means grave. So qubur means graves. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Bismillah. So this lesson we're going to speak about the double letter. When we have two letters that are the same joined together. Now this joining is called shadda, And it means to join with strength. So if we take the word shadda. What Arabs use for the sign of Shadda is the following. It's just that part of the word Shadda, which is that. So if we want to double this letter, what we do is we add the Shadda. That's it there. Now, a point to note is that the Shadda will always have a vowel mark accompanied with it. Either the Fatha, the Dhamma, or the Kasra. So, for example, we have here three scenes with a Shadda and the three different Harakat. So, as you can see, the Shadda with a Dhamma, the Shadda with a Kasra, and the Shadda with a Fatha. One point, the Kasra here is usually written under the Shadda, or it can actually be written underneath the letter itself. So the actual um, kasra can go down here as well. But the shedda stays there. The shedda will never be on the bottom. Another point is the shedda can go on any letter except for the hamza or the alif. So any other letter can accept a shedda. Now let's dissect the shedda on top of these layers. So we said that the Shedda represents a doubling of the letter. So here, there's two scenes, because the Shedda is there. So there's one scene, followed by another scene. Now the first scene will always have a Sukun. And then the second scene will have the actual haraka. Now let's put, for example, a letter before it. Because we know that a word cannot start with a sukun. You can't have a letter with a sukun starting off a word. So let's put the ra, for example. So to pronounce this, we would say, resu. 
Rasu. Notice how I give the double letter. Rasu. Rasu. Now similarly, this is two scenes as well. The sukun is on the first, followed by the kesra on the second. So if you put the ra once again, it would pronounce as rasi, rasi. Notice how I give emphasis to the scene. There's, it's the doubling of the letter, not rasi, rasi. And similarly, the scene with the shedda and fatha is a scene. Another scene. There's a sukun there, and there's a fatha there. So we put the ra, for example. Actually, let's change the letter. Let's put the mim. So the mim would be joined to it, and a fatha here. And I assume that there was these were fathas as well with the with the ra as well. So that's why um, it was rasi and rasu. So here it's masa. This is, this is actually a verb, messe, means to touch. Now, how this verb is actually written is the following. It's a meme followed by a scene. And there's a shed there. And it's messe. So a double letter will not be represented in this way. It will be done in this particular way. With the shed there. Now, a letter that has a shed there can never start a sentence, as we said. That's why I put a letter that has a harika on it. So put those the fathas on those so notice I put the, the those haruf those letters in front because there's no word that starts with a scene with a, with a sukun or any letter that has a sukun let's look at some words with the shadda so here we have three words actually four words because iyaka actually is made up of two different words with a particle and a pronoun so how do we pronounce this Iyaka. Notice the the ya gets a double vowel because of the the shadda there. Iyaka. Not. It's not iyaka. Iyaka. Also here. Al hajju. It's not al hajju. It's al hajju. And here, Rabbi. So it's alhamdulillahi Rabbil alamin. There's a shadda there. It's not Rabbi. So if I want to dissect this, it would be the Ra followed by two Ba's. There's the Fatha there. The first Ba takes a Sukun. And the second takes a Kesra. So it's Rabbi. So you notice actually that a Shedda will always give a new syllable to the word. Because the new syllable starts here. It's in between the first and the second letter that has the shadda. So that's briefly about the shadda. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Now this is a pronunciation exercise from what we learned so far. So the first one is it's ba nu. Ba nu. Next one is Bu and nu, so it's bunu. Next one we see is has a long vowel, so it's bana, not bana, bana. Next one, there's sukune on the vowel, so it's bow na, bow na. Next one is a long vowel as well, it's the u sound, so it's buna, buna. The next is Bayna. Then we have Bina. This is the long vowel. Bina. And finally, it's Bayana. So, so that there's a shed there. So it can actually be written as follows. The Ba, then the Ya, followed by another Ya, and then finally the Noon. So, Bay Ya Na So when there's a shed there, there's a double letter. The first letter has a sukun, 
And the second has the haraka that it has, which is here the fatha. So, bayana. Now let's go to the five words below. We'll pronounce it and give you the meaning. So the first word is fi. So you notice there's the elongation, the long vowel. Fi means in. And that in could either be physical or abstract. So we, if we say fil bait in the house. Or it could be abstract. For example, if I say fi ra'yi, which means in my opinion. Okay, next we have, and you notice here the long vowel as well, rana. And rana is a verb which means to cover in dirt or rust. Um, next word is kaifa. Kaifa. Kaifa means how. So, for example, if you meet somebody and say, kaifa haluka. How are you? Next word, huda. Now, this is not actually a ya. It's an alif. It's called an alif maqsura. And it's exactly like an alif, the way it's pronounced. It's like a ya, without the two dots. So we say, huda. There's the elongation as well, because of the because fatha, followed by an alif. If this wasn't there, it will be huda. But huda with the alif. Finally, we have the verb Kassara, which means to smash something into many pieces. It's an intensive form. With verbs, when we have the shadda, the verb involves intensity. And you can actually feel it the way it's pronounced. Kassara, instead of kassara. So once again, there's the kaf, followed by two scenes, and then the ra. So kas. Sukune Sara Kesara Not Kesara So it's very important with the Shedda To give it the double sound And sometimes people might be a bit too hasty And not give that double letter My best advice to you is maybe Go through the Quran And try to to read it And have for example a recording of it A clear recording And see if you pronounce it this exactly the same way I must warn you, there, there are many rules um, that might cause you to be a bit confused. And you might ask, why is it recited this way? It should be this way. But usually, most words in the Quran will be recited the way that they are written. So in this lesson, we're going to speak about the open and closed tap. So this is the open tap. And this is the closed tap. So it's quite obvious why they call that. Because of their shape. Now there are some differences. The first one is in which words they are found. So the open tap is used anywhere, meaning in any position of the word, and in any word. So either in the noun, or a verb, or a particle. So it's not restricted to any type of word in the Arabic language. While the tap, marbota, the closed tap only occurs at the end of a word and only in nouns. So let's look at some examples of this, inshallah. So here we have the word bait, baitun, this is the tenwin, and this is an open tap. We also have the word, for example, which means dates. So notice here the open ta at the beginning of a word. We also have, for example, a verb here, mata, which means he died. And ta can also occur alone as a particle. And one of its usages is particle of swearing an oath. Now with the ta marbota, the closed ta, we have the following words. So you notice here the ta marbota at the end of the word. And this is one thing about the ta marbuta. The way it's written is exactly the same as a ha. So if you remember the ha can be written in two ways at the end. If, for example, it doesn't join to the second last letter, it will be written on its own like this. Or if it's connected to the second last letter, it's written like this. Now the difference between the ha and the tamarbota is just the two dots at the top. 
So they're both Talmud Bultas now. Now the hat also has the medial form. If you remember the medial form, which is that. Now we said that the Talmud Bulta can never be in the middle of a word. It's always at the end. So this, you won't find a Talmud Bulta like that. That doesn't occur. Here the word is Medina and Khadija. Notice one thing, I didn't mention the ta. I actually pronounced the Tamar Buta as a ha. Medina Khadija. Now if I stop on the Tamar Buta, it's actually pronounced as a ha in both cases. So here Medina means a city and Khadija is a name of a female. The Tamar Buta also is a sign of femininity. So you find this Tamar Buta in a number of female words. So that's another point about the Tamar Buta. And thirdly, if you actually pronounce the last letter with the Harakeh, so for example, say when say Khadija 2. Notice Khadija 2. We pronounce the Ta. If we stop at the Ta, Khadija it's a ha. Medina. Or Medina Tun. If we put the tenween. Just a point there. Female names don't get a tenween. They only get one. Dhamma or one fetha. They don't take a kasra. But we'll speak about this, inshallah, later on. You don't need to know that at this stage. So the complete lesson. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Bismillah. Okay, in this lesson, we're going to speak about tenween. Now what tenween is, it's the double fetha, the double kasra, or the double dhamma, at the end of a word. And in fact, what tenween is, is the addition of a noon sound, the letter noon. In English, it's also called nunation. So you find that in some English books. And that's used synonymously with tenween. Now, just a point with how it's written. With the Fatah and Kasra, it's pretty straightforward. You just put one on top of the other. With the Dhamma, the two Dhammas, it could be written as this. So you have two Dhammas together. It could also be written as the following mark. You'll find this, you'll find this in some scripts. As well as... You have one Dhamma and that. So it's another way that it could be written. So all these represent two Dhammas together. Now, here we have the word Qalam. Qalam means pen. Now, for example, if you put one Dhamma, it will be Qalamu. If we put two Dhammas, It will be pronounced as Qalamun Qalamun So notice the Nun sound at the end It's pronounced as the following It's the Dhamma at the end Followed by Let's take this off Because we're going to put a Nun at the end A Nun With a Sukun So Qalamun That's how it's pronounced and this is how it's written. So you never write a tenween like this. Now, what does tenween indicate? The main thing it indicates is indefiniteness. So here, qalamun would be a pen. So here we have the word rajul, which means man. Now, if we want to say a man, we'd put tenween. Either the two dhammas, the two fethas or the two kesras. So either rajulun, rajulan, or rajulin. They all indicate a man. So the main usage of tenween is indefiniteness. So it's giving the sound of a noon with a sukun at the end of the word. Now let's go through some words with tenween. Okay, we have these four words. So the first one is Sarirun. So you see the tenween here. Next one is Mozatun. Third one, Ajalatun. And lastly, Ta'iratun. 
So notice the un sound at the end. And we can also put the two fathas and the two kasras also. So, for example, here sarir could be, let's take this off, it could be sariran or saririn. Now, one thing to note, with the two fathas, in most words, you'd put an extra alif. So let's just write Sarir out. It'll be Sari Sariran. So this alif is put with the two fathas only. The two dhammas and the two kasras don't get this. There's an exception. For example, the tamar bulta. See these three words, they all end in a ta marbuta, the closed ta. So this is a ta, but it's a closed ta, as opposed to the open ta. When a word ends with ta marbuta, even when it gets two fathas, it doesn't have an alif. So for example, ajalatun, let's write it, it will be ajala ten. Mozatun, if we want to make it two fathas, would be Moza, 10. Now, another point to note, most masculine proper nouns will have a tamween. Yet, they are still definite. So, any proper name, for example, Muhammad, we Muhammadun, Muhammadan, Muhammadin. So, they have tamween, but they're definite. With all other nouns, the tamween will indicate indefiniteness. Finally, just the meanings of these words... So Sarir with the Tenween is a bed. So Mozatun is a banana. Ajalatun is a bicycle. And Ta'iratun is a plane. That completes the lesson. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Okay, inshallah we're going to speak about definiteness. So we have in front of us the word Bait. Baitun. So you see the Tenween, which indicates indefiniteness. So Baitun is... A house. Now, to make something definite, what we do is we add an alif and lam in front of the word, as you can see there, and we take one of the dhammas away. So instead of the tenween, we have a single dhamma. And similarly, if there was, for example, say tenween with two fathas, then when we make it definite, there will be one fatha. And similarly, one kasra, if there was. So, al baytu, the house, a specific house. So, the process to make it definite is to add the alif and lam and to remove the tenween. Now, what is the alif lam? Now, in fact, I said to you the alif and lam, it's not an alif. This is actually a hamzat al wasl. So, we give it the sign. Of Hamzat al Wasl. And the Lam has a Sukun on it. Now, knowing that this is a Hamzat al Wasl, we know that with Hamzat al Wasl, if it starts off a sentence, it's pronounced. So, Al Baytu. But if there's something before it, let's say a Wow, what happens? It's Wal Baytu. So, this is not pronounced because it's in the middle of a sentence. Now, for example, in the Qur'an, we have this in Surah Al-Quraysh. And it says, فَلْيَعْبُدُ رَبَّ هَذَا And here is Al-Bayt. Now, there's a Kasra there, and there's the Al. So it's definite. And here, Al-Bayt refers to Baytullah, the house of Allah, the Kaaba. Now, here we have the word Hadha. So Hadha and Al Bayt. So how do we pronounce it? It's Hadha Al Bayt. So it's not Hadha Al Bayt. You don't pronounce this Hamzat Al Wasl here. So you go from this Alif to this Lam. Hadha Al Bayt. If it's the other sentence, it would be Al Bayt. Okay, let's continue on. Now, now, an important point is that proper nouns are all definite. Proper nouns, as in 
names of people, of places, of countries, and so on. Now in front of us we have five proper names. The first name we have is Muhammad. You notice at the end of it is the tenween, Muhammadun. Even though it has a tenween, it's still definite. And that's the same with, for example, Zayd. It's Zaydun, tenween as well. They're both masculine names. So with proper nouns, a tenween does not indicate indefiniteness. That's a rule there. Then we have the name Zainabu. Notice here, there's only one Dhamma. There's no tenween. Now the question is, why doesn't it have tenween? That's because feminine names actually don't take a tenween. They only have one Dhamma. And similarly with the name Mecca, the holy city of Mecca, it's actually a feminine name. And it only takes one Dhamma. Now the point is with feminine proper nouns, so it should be feminine proper nouns, they don't accept tenween, with rare exceptions. So th there are exceptions to these rules, and we're just learning the basic rule. And all the exceptions will be taught later on as you progress in your studies, inshallah. And finally we have Al-Iraq. Notice a few things. There's the Al here, and there's the Dhamma. Now there are a few things to note about this. So Al-Iraq is the country, Iraq. And that's how it's written in Arabic, Al-Iraq. This Al, Alif Lam, is not a Lam of definiteness. Because as we said, proper nouns are always definite. So it's not definite by the fact that it has this Al. It's already definite. It's the name of a country. So this Al is actually part of this word. You won't find the name Iraq. It's always accompanied with this Al. And some proper nouns actually have this Al joined to it. For example, we have the name Al-Abbas. Not Abbas, Al-Abbas, which is a masculine name. This is an extra Al, which occurs in some proper nouns. And it's not the Al that, to make a word definite like Al-Bayt. Now, just finally, I want to mention this point, is with the Al of definiteness, that the Hamzat al is always pronounced with a Fatha. Not a Kasra, and not a Dhamma. So it's always A. al bait, al tamar, and so on. It's never Ul, it's never Il. It's always Al. And I can be certain, Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Bismillah. Now, in this lesson, we're going to speak about the division of letters as sun letters and moon letters. Huruf shamsiya and Huruf Qamariya. Now, the letters I have that look like a moon, these letters are actually the moon letters. While the ones that have the sun on them are the sun letters. Now, why do we have this division? To demonstrate this, here we have the word Ashems and Al Qamar. The sun and the moon. That's what they mean. And this is the Al of definiteness that we spoke about in the previous lesson. Now, when you add Al to these, you'll notice a few things. Let's first of all start with Al Qamar. How do we pronounce this? It's Al Qamar. So, Al Qamar. So, there's a sukun there on top of the lamb. And it's Al Qamar. There's no issues with that. But when we come to Ashams, there's something that's happening. And this has to do with the articulation point of the lamb and the letter following it, which here is the sheen. And to actually find out the articulation point, have a hamza with a fatha followed by the lamb. So we say Al, Al, with a tita, Al. Al. And do the same thing with the sheen. Ash. Ash. The actual points of articulation of the lamb and the sheen are very close to each other. And because they're very close, what happens is this lamb is not pronounced. And what happens instead is the lamb is pronounced as a sheen. So there's a, actually a shedda here. So it's Ashems, 
Not Al Shams. Because you notice when you say Al Shams, it's not smooth. Rather than Al Shams, which flows and is nicer to hear. However, with Al Qamar, there's no issues with that. And that's because the articulation point of the lamb and the qaf are far apart. So the L is where the teeth and the tongue come together, and the qaf, aq, comes from the throat, which is far from the articulation point of the lamb. And because of this distance, it's much smoother to say it, because you're going from one articulation point to one that's further down. So it's al qamar. However, with lamb and, sh- and the sheen, the lamb is here, and the sheen is right next to it. al shams it's actually hard on the tongue to say. And then what that means is that these sun letters, the ta, the tha, dal, the ra, ze, and so on, if they come as the first letter of the word, after the l is being added, there will be a shadda on the letter, and the lamb will not be pronounced. And similarly, for for example, the alif, ba, jim, ha, kha, and so on, if they actually come after the l of definiteness, they're always pronounced. And the lamb is also pronounced as well with sukun. Now let's see these words in the Quran. So this is in Surah Ash-Shams, and it says, "Washamsi wa duhaha." So notice, "Washams." This is al of definiteness. This is hamzat al-wasl. It's not pronounced because there's something before it. Similarly, this lamb is not pronounced either because, as we said, this is from the sun letters. And there's a shadda there. So it's washams. Then we have wal qamari idha talaha. Wal qamar. So you notice the lamb here has a sukun on it. Now the mushaf, when the lamb is not pronounced, it doesn't have any sign on it. It's written, but there's no sukun. But here it's wal qamari idha talaha. So the qaf is from huruf al qamariya. Now let's take examples of this, inshallah. Here we have the moon letters, and here we have the sun letters. And we have here, Al-Abu, the father. Notice here, Al-Abu, it's pronounced. Al-Babu, the door. Al-Jannah, Al-Himar, Al-Khubz, and so on. So you see how the, the lamb has the sukun and it's pronounced in all cases. The huruf shamsiya, notice here, it's, we have at-tajiru, at, at-tajiru, there's a shadda there. At-thawb, the garment. At-deek, the rooster. At-dhahab, the gold. Ar-rajul, the man, and so on. Now, it's good to memorize which letters are the moon letters and which are the sun. It will help initially. But then later on, it will become second nature to you. So my advice is just to practice. And a good way to do this is to listen to a Quran recitation and see how the words are pronounced. Like a best lesson, Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Oh